A7 derivations. I would like to spend some time talking about derivations because over my career, actually very early in my career, I discovered that what one may call a derivation in physics is not considered a derivation in mathematics, right? In other words, what pleases a physicist in a derivation is often not enough to please a mathematician. So I'm gonna give you a specific example briefly, but let me give you three general cases here. One is the Dirac delta function. Now Dirac came up with a function, which I can show you here in the coordinate system where you have x and we have some f of x going up in that axis, so x and f of x. Dirac's delta function is that Dirac's delta function is that x, any x except zero has the function equal to zero. In other words, the function equals zero when x is not zero. So that would be on this side too. The function has zero height, zero height, except for that point in the middle. And then when x equals zero, the function is equal to infinity. Now, now see, that's like, what is that? One point way, way up at no, way up in the sky and then everything else zero. But Dirac's able to do a lot of good physics using this definition and work things out with it. Now, when I was teaching quantum mechanics for the first time at UNC Asheville many, many years ago, I was doing the standard approach, introducing the Dirac Della function. And I had a student in my class that was a math major and a physics major. He was very unhappy. He would go back to the math department and talk to his math professor, his favorite math professor. And he would sort of like, you know, talk, talk my course down, you know, saying like, what's this guy doing? You know, and I didn't like that talking behind my back. And then I noticed that one of my math physics books was a, a math physics book that had rich mathematics in it uh, that a mathematician would be happy with. Now, we don't use that kind of uh, detail in our physics course, but I went to see the math professor with the book in hand. And I said, I hear you're like, you know, not liking my uh, direct delta function. He says, yeah, we don't like that. That's, uh, you know, all the zero and then all infinity way uh, x equals zero and no, no, that's, that's, that's not, that's not good. I says, well, well, how about this? I opened this mathematical physics book that had in this book, they had, now here's the Gaussian. That's something like this, the bell shaped curve you see in probability. So here you have X and we have F of X. So I, sh I show him this function. Of course, he likes that. Mathematicians like that. Look, it's defined everywhere here and you can take derivatives. And then I said here, now suppose we play with the parameters in the Gaussian and get a Gaussian that is more narrow, higher, like this. And the area with these Gaussians in probability theory, for theory that the probability is for something to occur is one. So like the area under these graphs are all one. So I basically said, now, if we make the graph higher and higher, but narrower and narrower, you then get the Dirac idea of having zero everywhere and then the infinity at x equals zero. Mathematician said, said, this is good. She said, I like this. This is, yeah, basically this is good. It's continuous. You can take the root of this everywhere. He was happy. But physicists won't take the time to work the problems that Dirac worked at using this technique, uh, this great detail, what they'll do is they'll simply use Dirac's formulation, which is this here, and work with this. A second example is quantum mechanics itself. When physicists were developing quantum mechanics in the 1920s, 
they found for bound state solutions that would have uh, infinite amount of energy levels, discrete energy levels as solutions. And each uh, energy level had a function uh, that was similar to the other fun to other solutions, but that would be a little different. And they would find the general solution by adding up all these, a contribution from all those. So they would have an infinite amount of solutions that would be summed together in different amounts to get the gen most general solution. And then they would assign each function to like a dimension and some infinite dimensional space. And that sounded a little, a little strange and weird, but then David Hilbert, the great mathematician, talked to physicists and other mathematicians and put this on a mathematical ground that's quite firm. And we named this infinite dimensional space that the physicists used in quantum mechanics, Hilbert space in David Hilbert's honor. But the physicists were happy just doing it their way without looking at it more formally. The last example I want to talk about is when I was in college, I was studying with a research advisor doing a research project, and I needed to look into a graduate textbook by Jackson, a Classical Electrodynamics, a great textbook used for decades in graduate school in physics. So we were looking at a few pages there and we were struggling to try to understand things. You know, when you do research, you're advising, you're, you're, you're breaking new grounds, you're in new grounds. So we wanted to understand this book better. So I suggested maybe you should go like talk to a mathematician. And he said, yeah, that's good. Go see the mathematician. So I went to a math professor, showed him the Jackson book, showed him the page and asked for some insight as to what we were doing. And he is looking at this and he's starting to make a face. Then he starts to turn the pages and he's looking disgusted. And he says, this is not mathematics. Like, whoa. And this book is a accepted standard with classical treatments and, you know, a rigor from the physics point of view, but the mathematician was not happy at all. So this is what I'd like to point out is that when I derive something in the physics course, it may not be, let's say, acceptable uh, to please, you know, please the mathematician, but that's okay. However, a lot of the things that we will derive are taken straight from math books, like an infinite series, you know, the test to see if it converges or not. So math folks would be pleased with a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to worry about when they are pleased, when they're not pleased, we're here to do geophysics and geodesy and normal gravity. So the last thing in this chapter is to give you an example, a specific example of what pleases a physicist and what pleases a mathematician with the same problem. And the problem that I'm going to do, so we'll call this, so the problem that I'm going to do is to sum the odd integers. Now the odd integers are one, three, five, seven. You just simply add two as you go along. And I wanna have a formula that if I take n of these, now this is gonna be the first one, this is gonna be the second one, and this is the third one. So we need to have a way to relate when n is equal to one, two, three, four, five, this n, we need to get the integers. So we need to get the odd integers. One, we need to get three from the two and the five and the seven and the nine. And the way to do that is simply double this n here, like two times two is four and subtract one, get three. Two times three is six, subtract one, get five. Two times four is eight, subtract one, get seven. Two times five is 10, subtract one, get nine. And the first one works too. Two times one is two, subtract one, get one. So in other words, for the general n here, like if I were to look at the general one there, the general case here is two n minus one. So when n is one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, the odd integers are found by plugging in n equals one, two, three, four, five to this formula and you get them. 
So the sum of n odd integers would be 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 dot 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 up until 2n minus 1. And I want to prove or show that that's equal to n squared. First, we'll do it as an informal derivation, which is all you need for a physicist to be happy. And to do this, we construct a square. And I want to make the square have 4 by 4 for the dimensions. So there are 16 squares. Now, this one square here has one square. Notice that the next square going up, 2 by 2, it has three more, three more squares in there. So if I add the one first odd integer, uh, positive you know, integer, with the second positive one, the three, I get four. And if I want the next integer, which is five, I got one, two, three, four, five. I add these, but now I have a three by three square. So if you look at that, add these up, you have nine total, you have three by three. So in other words, this is three squared to get nine. And that's the third case. If I look at the second case where I just have the three, the second case, that's a two by two. Well, if I go two by two, that's four. And if you add these two together, you get four. Let's try one more. If we wanna add, say here, seven, the next odd integer, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That would be adding these blocks. And if I had seven more blocks, well, look at this. I got four by four. I got 16. So this is four squared, the fourth case, four squared. Say, a physicist is happy. The nth case is going to be n squared. Now, We'll go on and please the mathematician. The mathematician wants a formal proof or formal derivation or formal. We'll say formal proof. That stresses that we're doing something real serious here, right? In more detail. Now for the more formal, for the formal proof, I'm going to use proof by induction. So what you do for the proof for induction, you assume that it's true for the nth case. So we, we assume that this is true. Then we're gonna prove that if it's true there, that it would be true for the next case. And then we're gonna show if it's true for the first case, true for all the cases. Now, what is the next case? Well, you, you simply add two to the last term, because that's how you get all these terms. You know, you add two to the one, you get three, you add two to the three, you get five. So here, one plus three plus five plus dot, 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 two n minus one. Now, we just simply add two. If we add two, you get two n minus one plus two. Simply, is going to be plus one. All right, so adding two to this. You can just think of the two n is there, and we have two minus one, you have the one. All right, now we know this is true by assumption. So what about if we were to add the two n plus one to this? Well, if you look at this, if you take n plus one and square it, you would get this. n squared plus the cross term two n plus one. So it's true for the next one, if it's true for this one. Now we have to show that it's true for the first case. Well, for the first case, you would just have the one. Well, is that equal to the one squared? It is. So it's proven for in general. 
So in our course, even though we'll have a lot of derivations or proofs uh, from math books that will be acceptable to mathematicians, some will not be, and we're not going to worry about which type of proof it is when we demonstrate things. So the last thing I want to mention is the respect I have for mathematicians, respect I have for physicists, and respect I have for engineers. So let's look at the mathematician first. The mathematician wants the formal proof. Fine, that's excellent. And, I, and, and a lot of the things I'll show you satisfy the formal proofs, all right? If we look at the physicists' derivations, uh, they're the ones that will not be, let's say, as rigorous, but they're convincing. And a lot will be used there. But then what about not even deriving anything? I was just looking something up. Well, I have great respect for engineers because when I taught engineering for seven years and was given the title adjunct professor of engineering at North Carolina State University, I got to respect what they do. And here, if an engineer is working with a project an application, you're not going to derive a formula that's already in a book. If you already have a formula book, you're going to use it. You might need to tweak it or change it or derive something specific for your example, but you're not going to go back and do the basic formula over again. You're just going to look that up. Just like you're going to consult tables of properties of water. If you're working with water and steam, uh, scientists spent decades, you know, gathering data and putting them in tables. So an engineer, uh, this course here would be uh, not necessary. In other words, I give you the formula in this chapter, uh, and the engineer would just take it and use it. And that's great. Now, if the engineer wants to go into more detail and, and understand things that, like the way a theoretical physicist does, well, that's, that's cool. So, you know, being in the various uh, fields and teaching, I respect uh, everyone's decision. So this course here is for those that want to see all the steps, everything derived for normal gravity. If you want to do that, this course is for you. If not, then you would go to some other courses that you know are better suited for your interest. One last thing I'll say is that when Helene came and wiped out my backyard and blocked my driveway, I couldn't get out of the house, I couldn't get out, and eventually it went electrical went out, the water went out, the water was out for like weeks. Electrical was out, I think, for like over a week or two. It was very, very depressing, and our life, our lives changed drastically. We had to then go to the, the stream to get water, to like flush toilets, and then go out and, and configure, have a good carpool, and find a place that would sell a, a food for us. And this course, preparing for this course, during the couple hours of daylight where I had some free time, I would prepare for this course, uh, theoretical physics, normal gravity, and that was psychologically very, very helpful for me in that very difficult time. So I really appreciate theoretical physics now for, as a psychological mental health aspect that you're feeling bad or whatever, you can, you can uh, look at, at something like this course and work things out and feel uh, elated uh, on high. And uh, that's why I do it. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do and get to uh, appreciate the uh, beauty and elegance of deriving things in theoretical physics.